I'm going to do it. Great, great. Yeah, it was, yeah. Good morning, everybody. So I think we're about to get started. So welcome to our second in our series for the spring lecture series for Center for Children and Families. This is again, part of our Owens era tour. I see so many t-shirts. I did not wear mine today. I feel horrible. I meant to and halfway up, I realized I forgot. So thank you for buying the t-shirts. That's wonderful. Along with the series, what we're doing is kind of paying tribute to Margaret Owen's career in terms of the research she has done and showing how that work has moved forward and how we have new generation of researchers kind of building from the work that Margaret has done in the past. So today in our second series, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Annie Wright here. So Dr. Wright is the executive director of CORE at SMU. So CORE is the Center on Research and Evaluation. It's on research and evaluation, which makes it say CORE. So I always mess that up. Um, so we're lucky to have her here. She got her PhD at South Carolina, right? University right. of South Carolina. Yeah. And her work really looks at how we can evaluate and work with programs working within different ecosystems. So what you're going to hear a lot about today is moving beyond what she does a lot in pre-K through year 12, but doing a lot beyond just schools and actually after school and out of school time. So this is a project where she is working now on a project that Margaret is involved in too. So you're going to see this kind of movement in the research. So thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have thank you. Thank you. Good morning everyone. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Annie. Uh, yes, down at the Center on Research and Evaluation. Thank you so much for having me. I was here a couple of years ago as well. Um, so fun to have the, the Owen eras going. My kids are going to try to steal this shirt. Um, I wanted to just uh, start by thanking Margaret for creating this space. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, I know this will shock you, but university centers can get a little competitive with one another. And Margaret has always leaned towards collaboration um, and really invited me in, invited our center in, in a variety of ways, um, and ta taught me a very valuable lesson from the very beginning about how to interact in this city and like really create truly have our university centers be part of this uh, extended learning ecosystem. I hope that our centers are part of that as well. So um, also, I don't know if to um, thank Margaret for this yet, but <laughs> my involvement in this project is directly related to her. So, so far, super fun, but also challenging. Uh, but um, that's right, that's right. There's the spirit of collaboration, right? It's like, oh, I think they should work on this. And I think I thank you for that. No, I'm just totally kidding. I, to I totally thank you for it. Okay, so let's dive in. We're gonna talk a little bit about how we got to the study and where we are. We're gonna talk about active, playful learning, the intervention that we are uh, providing and studying. I'll talk a little bit about the study design itself and then kind of where, where we're going next and intend to leave uh, lots of time for questions as well. So this is our team. I think some of y'all might be on uh, Teams right now as well. So good morning. Uh, CORE is located in the Simmons School of Education and Human Development. We're a pretty interdisciplinary group. I am a clinical community psychologist. Most of the folks on our team have uh, an educational background, so they were either were teachers or, or came through uh, that pathway to get to educational research. As Mandy mentioned, we have a cradle to career lens and really focused on the, the lifespan exposure to educational opportunities. We certainly do a lot of work in schools. APL is, is primarily an in-school intervention. But one of the things we really try to pay attention to is all the places and spaces where learning and development takes place. And so that's where we spend a lot of time thinking about after school and summer and arboretums and museums and churches and soccer fields and all of the places where indeed active playful learning can, can take place. So at CORE, we live in the research practice gap on purpose. 
we are a um, kind of an outward facing center. We are all SMU staff. We, we actually do have an office on SMU campus, even though uh, we're mostly uh, out and about in the city and in North Texas. When we think about bridging the research practice gap, we really have a value orientation around making that highly democratic and collaborative. So sometimes you might hear the research practice gap uh, talked about in more of a hierarchical sense, right? That like researchers know stuff and we try to get practitioners to do it. That is one way of thinking about the research practice gap, and indeed, sometimes we are in that role, but we really try to expand that out and acknowledge the expertise, the knowledge of practitioners. So we talk about research based evidence and we talk about evidence based research and really try to make this a two way reciprocal learning relationship. Part of the way we do uh, research practice work is through a long time collaboration with Dallas Independent School District. <laughs> so I've been at CORE for 10 years and I promise the first day that I walked into that job, I was reaching out to the research review board at Dallas Independent School District because we were gonna do studies together. And so it's taken 10 years, <laughs> um, but very much to their credit, they have also been back and forth and saying, how can we make this easier, right? So instead of just mm -hmm. sending one research application after another and just flooding their poor office with all of our requests, how can we think more efficiently about that? So uh, last year, we formally established the Consortium on Educational Research and Improvement. Uh, we call it Siri, so we can ask Siri, right? Because we think we're so cute. Ask Siri about what's working in education. Um, and we have really purposefully uh, defined the, the elements of this consortium is that it be mutually beneficial, right? So it's not that researchers are coming in, collecting the data, going off, publishing a paper, and never bring it back. The studies that we are collaborating on are co-designed. We uh, really work closely with leadership at Dallas to listen to the problems of practice that they're bringing, that they wanna also study. And then I think this piece of it is important is that the, the study design is intended to be very cyclical and we build in really rapid feedback loops. So it's not just kind of a one way street and three years later, there might be a paper that gets published, but then like the name is stripped and we don't even know what district we're talking about, right? So we're, we're really trying to kind of break that mold and feed highly uh, rigorous, good evidence back to the people who need it most. So under research practice partnerships and under the Consortium on Educational Research and Improvement, I was driving down the street one day, check my phone at a red light and I have a text from Dr. Margaret Owen and she says, call me, we got to talk. And I was like, uh oh. <laughs> so Dr. Kathy hirsch -Pasick, um, apples don't fall, here we are. It, like, it, like the universe is very small. So Mandy worked with, um, Kathy, um, and so here we are still still working with the same group of collaborators long term, which is actually really wonderful to, to see those those long term partnerships. Um, Dr. Hirsch Pasek received a grant from the Lego Foundation to study active playful learning. This is a national study. It's a coaching study, which I'll describe in more detail. And we have decided to focus it on math instruction in particular. There are four sites around the country. So University of Virginia, University of Chicago, University of California, Irvine, and good old Southern Methodist University representing <laughs> North Texas. So the, the sites were chosen somewhat strategically, partially because uh, the location of some of these collaborators, some of these researchers there, but also um, Texas is an important place for study right now. Um, not only do we represent a large portion of the youth in the United States, um, but there's a lot of interest around the political climate in Texas. Everybody calm down, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> but like, there's this sense that if we can implement these kind of interventions in this political environment, we can do it anywhere. So there's, there's, a, there's a scaling kind of approach and there is a real acknowledgement that 
the country's future is in this area right here. OK, so active playful learning. I'll talk first about just kind of the high level uh, uh, framework for thinking about the work. So active playful learning utilizes a three part equation. I'll start on the left hand side, cultural values. So wow, we've spent some time talking about what this means. Mm -hmm. um, in, in some ways, what this means is that each of these different regions of the country have really different needs. And so any one intervention cannot just be implemented, you know, like a, a, the, the model has to adapt to meet regional needs and regional differences. At the classroom level, when we're thinking about schools, when we're thinking about teachers, th this also means that we commit to centering the needs and the experiences of families and kids. That treating children as human beings and acknowledging their lived experiences must be the launching place from everything that follows. Add to that, um, what we're going to call the science of how children learn. I should have sent this around earlier. Can you help me? Okay, so folks on Teams will circulate this around, but this is just a little handout for what each of these little um, petals on this, this middle flower here are. This is the idea that when learning experiences are meaningful when they are joyful when they have a component of social interaction to them when they're active that means you're up and moving around not just passively sitting there receiving information as you are now do as we say not as we do right um when the learning opportunities are engaging and when they're iterative, so when we come back to them over time in a number of different ways, that is when deeper learning occurs. The last piece of the equation is the, the result, if you will, of deeper learning. This is what children learn when learning happens in this way. So I'm sure you've heard of 21st century skills and the five C's. Well, now we're going to talk about the six C's. Communication, collaboration, confidence, creative innovation, critical thinking, and I think the key piece here is content, right? So it is about learning the material, learning the, the, the fact of the matter, as well as the skill sets around the, the content itself. Okay, so let's talk about uh, in a little bit more detail what active playful learning uh, is and is not. So imagine in this little grid up at the top, you have learning that is initiated either by the child or the adult. Um, and then over on the left hand side, again, directed. So if the child decides what they want to do and they initiate that learning experience and then they lead it right they they direct it they follow it through that's what we call free play wonderful we know lots of learning and development happens when free play is happening when a child initiates a learning experience but it's directed by the adult we might call that co-opted play. I actually thought that co-opted was a little harsh. <laughs> Certainly you can imagine, you can imagine an adult coming in and saying, what are you doing? Do this instead, right? We might call that co-opted. But in a affirming, more positive frame, we could also see a really uh, skillful teacher or adult noticing what the child is doing and saying, I see that you are pouring that water into that cup. Would you like to come see this, right? And so so using that initiated learning opportunity as, as a true teachable moment, right? When a teacher initiates and directs, we call that direct instruction. There is a time and a place for direct instruction. Every square on this grid has pros and cons. Learning happens in every grid. 
Where the real sweet spot for active playful learning is when a teacher or adult initiates the learning, has a plan, right, for kind of what the content is, what we're going to be doing today, but then allows the child to direct it and allows the child to move through kind of their natural playful way, right? The scientist in the crib, I know all of you all know this well. So this is, this is the, the bullseye. The idea for active playful learning is that in most educational settings, we see direct instruction, right? Especially for that K through fourth grade uh, target uh, age that APL is focused on. Um, so we want to see more movement towards that guided play uh, part of the grid. We talk about guided play in these ways. So active playful learning uh, really rests on these pillars, which we've already talked about, right? You've got those on your, your handout. And because the pillars are a little um, subjective, right? So like what Mandy thinks is joyful or what I think is joyful might, might really have some, some contextual difference to it. We also talk about these practices that when these practices are in place, these types of learning experiences are more likely. So the practices that we really focus on, and this matters for measurement too, right? Because it's very hard to measure the pillars. It's a lot easier to measure whether the practices are taking place. We're looking at instruction that happens in small and paired groups. Again, as we say, not as we do, I do not have you in small paired groups. I have you in rows, uh, just doing uh, brain dump direct instruction, but also you're grownups. You're not second graders, right? So there's a different kind of learning here. Uh, practices also increase students' contributions to interactions with peer and teachers, right? So that's part of that engagement piece. Practices that support hands-on, minds-on, exploration, discovery, inquiry giving students choice and voice in their own learning. Even if the teacher is initiating the learning opportunity, then really kind of following their lead and, and letting them find their way. Helping students connect their learning to other experiences, both in and out of school. This is a, a real central value to the project, um, both in terms of creating that deeper uh, learning opportunity, but also going back to this acknowledgement of lived experiences, cultural context of really letting students and in fact encouraging students to bring their whole experiences into their learning environment. And this one is critical infuse enthusiasm and positivity into the learning experience. Um, I think we all know um, just how um, how hard the teaching profession is right now. It's always been hard, uh, but particularly in the last couple of years. And so one of the things we've heard from, from teachers and others as, as we've started talking about this approach is like, there's like this exhale and like, oh, yeah, that's why I wanted to be a teacher, right? Uh, because I because I find joy in in interacting with kids in this way. Okay, so we're gonna so we're gonna uh, try this. Bear with me. We're gonna do one lesson two ways. So first, we're gonna do perhaps a very typical direct instruction strategy. Okay. So those of you on Teams, this is the worksheet that we are looking at. So pretend that you are a, I don't know, first or second grader, and you're in your little desk, and she's just gonna hand out your work to you. I'll grab these for this. Okay. So <laughs> just take a minute. We've got some manipulatives going, right? Way to go. So we're not just doing paper and pencil. Um, and your teacher says, line up the cubes, line up the linking cubes under the object on the paper, and then circle the word that best completes the comparison. So you don't really have to do this, but just like take a look, right? What do you think? <laughs> any Any initial reactions to the the worksheet itself and the, the learning uh, task at hand here. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
Excellent. Hold on to that. I'm going to come right back to that because like wh why why not go measure your teacup that's on the wall? Right. Anyway, yes. So we're sticking with a worksheet. Interesting. <laughs> they don't all happen, but yeah, you have a bigger audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't take into account like what the kid might be interested in, right? So right. they just are very selective about the items that you have to use and what you're comparing to. Yeah, totally. And only two answers of what you can do at each. All There's the a time. right and a wrong. There's not really room for kind of interpretation. Also, like, why is that ant almost as big as the <laughs> Hershey's bar, right? There's there's like weird, uh, distorted. This is not based in reality, right? So, like, what is that communicating to a kid who's really learning about this stuff? <laughs> I think to your point, too, Mandy, there's no narrative around this, right? There's no context. There's like those are seemingly a, a random set of of items. Also not very precise, right? So like, does your cube like perfectly line up? And then, you know, what if what if your item is a little past? Like, what do I do then? OK, so you get it. So now let's go to an APL classroom instead. So imagine that your second grade teacher has now asked students in the class to bring something from home. Bring your favorite toy. Now you get to have some time talking about why this is your favorite toy, right? Maybe there's a story around it. Who gave you this? Did, is this your brother's? This kind of thing. We're not going to worry yet about whether we can measure these things. We just care that the student is bringing this in, telling their own story, feeling like they have a, a connection to the lesson. Now we're going to break students into small groups. We're going to get out those cubes because they really are great. <laughs> Um, and maybe we're going to just start start playing with some initial like if I put how many cubes do I have to put next to the doll to to match the height of the doll because I'm now I'm now co-opting a little bit. That's fine. Um, maybe I'm not going to measure that soccer ball because that brings in a whole other uh, strain of measurement. Right. But because I've invited all the students in, they all have a thing. Now I can pick a toy that lends itself to the lesson that I'm working on today. Um, students just start playing with this, right? Just exploring it, but then we can start iterating. Now I can send that student around the room and maybe I've planted some objects already, right? So now they can measure the height of their chair or the length of different pencils or the length of their paper, right? There's all kinds of net manipulatives. Now naturally in the classroom um, or the home, right? You could. You could probably pull that off on Zoom, um, but now we're connecting the meaningful toy that the child brought to the physical environment. And yes, then you can take it to a worksheet, but you can see the kind of holistic iterative approach, right? This is one pretty simple example, but I think you can you can see in it, there's the meaningful aspect, right? There was something about this that the child at least had a connection to, right? It doesn't have to be like this hugely emotionally salient, but just there is a connection. There is some kind of meaning there. Um, I'm gonna go counterclockwise. The iterative piece is clear. Right, there are multiple ways that this teacher is then approaching the same idea, can grow on it over time, add complexity, hopefully engaging, right? So you could imagine sitting on the floor together, you could imagine moving around the room, sitting in small groups. That gets your active and socially interactive piece of this. The joyful part is special because you could imagine all of those things happening and still have really flat affect or even negative affect if, if a teacher's being um, uh, has that negative emotion in the room, right? So the joyful piece of this is is special and it doesn't necessarily uh, reflect the the lesson structure itself. That has to be um, coached and and kind of primed in a different way. OK, so so simple example, I hope, um, but I think you can really kind of see the stark difference, you know, when we're talking about 
these modal learning environments and what we think promotes deeper learning. Here's two other quick examples. So over on the left, oh, there's Margaret. There's Margaret cheering Renee on. Uh, <laughs> so this was when we were up in Chicago this summer. I don't remember what we called this game, Margaret, but you can see the, the targets on the ground, right? So there's a plus one, a minus two, a plus three. And so you can line the kids up. You can have them throw the uh, bean bag, and then they do math equations based on the bean bag. So if Renee throws that and it lands on a minus two and a plus three, you could do multiplication, you could do adding and subtracting, like where, wherever you are in the, uh, in the learning arc, you could have teams. I mean, there's all kinds of ways then you can start taking that basic application. Same idea over on the right. This is, let's see, that's uh, Taylor Johnson on the right. She's our uh, project coordinator. Um, she is, those are our um, Dallas ISD teachers this year doing a live number line, right? So, so perhaps instead of just moving your little pencil on the number line, you can you could take up the whole hallway, uh, right? And have the kids move back and forth. You can combine lots of these strategies. <laughs> So I am not a math educator. I am a community psychologist. <laughs> I have found myself in educational and community based evaluations. But when I listen to this math content, it's so intuitive, right? Like it just like, yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's one of the things that's really nice about this initiative. And that really does speak to the the. Um, the intellectual heft of the people who are working on this is that they have made something really impactful, but very simple. That and this, and when I say simple, I mean that in the best term, right? Like that makes it very elegant. That makes it very accessible. Uh, certainly in academia, we have a tendency to over <laughs> complicate things and it gets in our way. So when we look at these kinds of lessons and we go like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes something more uh, uh, able to implement, right? Re yeah. Why share. Yeah. Your husband's reaction, former teacher. Why not? Why? Oh no. Tell me. I don't remember. Tell me. Talk about this again. Oh, or maybe. maybe. Yeah. But, uh, thank you. Yeah. Applying this to math. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. And then you. I had a really good answer. Yeah, you did. <laughs> And I was hoping you would reiterate it, but, but <laughs> you gave ways and it was in part what we physically yeah. Yeah. and mentally yeah. experienced when we yeah. were all together in yeah. Chicago last right. summer. Right. Doing this sort of stuff yeah. and yeah. playing on a big open field. Totally. Okay. Yeah. And well, we I mean, got it then really quick. Yeah. I mean, I think part part of the the focus on math is the the scaffolded lessons, right? There really is a sequ sequence to learning where you learn this first, you learn this next, they layer on each other. Um, and so it really does lend itself to the iterative. Um, but I think uh what one thing I will also say, and this this gets to kind of like a broader lens of uh, research practice partnerships with the district. Um, Y'all may know in Texas, there's a big push right now for high quality instructional materials, but that comes from TEA. Great. In Dallas ISD, that means that Dallas has adopted Eureka Math. Carnegie Math, I think, for, for middle school, and Amplify as like the reading language arts curriculum. Um, you all may be uh, familiar with that in other areas as well. So when we're coming along with APL saying we can provide coaching to help implement Eureka Math, now we're meeting a real need of the district. We're not just coming in saying we want to do this study for this thing we're in, we're interested in. We really are supporting a major initiative that you're also invested in. If that had not been the case, I don't know that we would have gotten permission to do this, right? You have to meet these organizations where they are. Going to see if I can come up with the brilliant idea that I had. <laughs> OK, OK, so. APL is a coaching study. 
This means that we as the um, external partners are coming in to K through fourth grade classrooms and providing coaching to the classroom teacher and then supporting their ability to start doing those APL practices. So I want to share a little bit about that approach to coaching. I think this is also a really just strong part of the initiative. This is not like get in there and just, you know, like see how it goes. This is a very systematic, measurable approach. So I think I have a little more to add here. OK. So here's a sample semester. Uh, by the way, it never goes like this, but this is aspirational. Let's say in September, you magically have your classrooms assigned. You start out with a pre-survey. So the coach goes in, just kind of gets a, a lay of the land. Um, our teachers participate in our day long workshops and then initial coaching visits start. Coaches work with the teacher to set some initial goals and the goals that they're setting are around which of these pillars would you like to work on, right? So there's some voice and choice for the teacher mixed into that as well. Uh, then kind of going through the, the rest of the school year, you can just kind of start seeing this cyclical work of working through some lesson enhancements. That means Eureka math, doing some coaching and observation and coming back. And so there's a cyclical but very systematic uh, approach um, baked into the process. Here's the way that we are conceptualizing coaching. So I'll start at the bottom of the triangle. So we acknowledge that there is foundational knowledge. Teachers know stuff. They already are experts at what they are doing. So acknowledging that they have a, a strong understanding of the the needs and the resources in the room um coming in with that attitude instead of coming in with i'm here to change what you're doing in your room is is really critical in the second tier in the 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 middle space of the triangle here there you can see the pillars right this is what we're starting to work in Tier three would be the idea of being able to transfer and extend these practices, for example, outside of uh, math um, and start to start to see more saturation of the work. So the extent to which um, those uh, tier two pillars are at play, we're measuring those by looking at the practices. OK, so how's it going? <laughs> Um, happy to say we have launched a pilot year. This is no small feat, truly. Um, there are 240 students served through the through the coaching through 12 pre-K, K and first grade classrooms. So here's another example. The study is targeted on K through fourth grade teachers, um, but Dallas ISD has a real investment in pre-K and for ages, CORE has collaborated with Dallas ISD Early Learning Department on their pre-K classrooms. So part of what we wanted to do was, again, meet them where they are, find out how the APL initiative fit with other things they were already doing. So we wanted to include a couple of pre-K uh, teachers in that mix as well. Um, you know, this number of observation and feedback sessions, that's one coach <laughs> going in and getting through all of those sessions, which is uh, uh, really impressive. We have 10 teachers now who have mastered their first goal. So that means they've kind of made their way through that first coaching cycle. They're ready to pick another pillar and go try out something else. And um, so far, 10 of 10 would recommend uh, say that this this coaching is going well. I, I want to um, acknowledge our lead coach, Renee Yanis. I'm not sure if she's on, but if you are, hello, Renee. Um, she was previously a coach with Dallas ISD. So she knows these schools. She knows these teachers. Um, and I think that that kind of bridge, it was really, really um, essential to us also being able to be in this particular school and have a, a standing relationship. She had already won the trust and rapport with those teachers. This would not have happened without that being in place. That takes time to build. Ready to talk about the study? 
So we are delivering coaching. So the grant allows us to hire coaches to go into the classrooms to provide this coaching. And we are studying whether and how it's working. So I'll go left to right here at the, you know, kind of national level, both the national team and then the site teams, which certainly Margaret and I are a part of here in Texas. We are co-developing training and coaching resources. So, you know, going through those Eureka math lessons and we, we say, how would we APLify this, right? How do we take this thing that, uh, you know, this content, this lesson that our teachers have to do and then add this, this layer um, of making it engaged, socially interactive, meaningful, right? It's a nice little bow to put, put on that content. At each site, our coaches go into classrooms. We, we provide that one day training and then follow up with one on one coaching um, on the pillars and the practices. At the classroom level, um, teachers adopt and apply APL practices in their classroom specific to math. This is I, I said that like it's happening. That's actually a hypothesis, right? That's a that's what we're we're hoping is happening. That's what we're measuring. And then if teachers do this, then uh, we think we see that deeper learning for students. We think um, we see content knowledge increase in math specifically and uh, see growth on those six C's. Don't ask me yet how we're measuring those six C's. That remains to be yes, seen. <laughs> Tomorrow? I thought it was this morning. Oh, yeah, it's at noon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so here are the key questions. That first linking arrow between what the coaches do and what the teachers do. If teachers engage in training and coaching, do they adopt <laughs> APL practices? Secondary question. If teachers utilize APL, does student learning deepen? And this really is an if then logic. Um, there is a like, do not pass go, do not collect $200. If we start measuring student learning, but we haven't established that first link in the results chain, then we might attribute that change to the wrong thing, right? So we really wanna stay focused on does coaching change instructional practices. Simple and yet very complicated. So the original design for this five-year study was uh, that we would have an initial pilot year and that next year, starting in August of 24, we would launch a randomized control trial. That would mean that we would recruit classrooms, recruit teachers all across the country and say out of, let's say, 100 classrooms, we would randomly assign these 50 par to participate in coaching and these 50 to not, but still collect all of the same data from both of them and see what the differences are. Challenging. <laughs> Where we have landed is that in year one, we're still in the pilot year, but we're now looking at years two, three, and four as an implementation study that allows us, first of all, to really figure out what the APL intervention is. We are still learning. We are not ready to implement the APL model in August and measure it with real predictable rigor, right? So we really, we're still working through the kinks. Um, you guys saw, you know, all the differences in the way that the, the coaching model might play out, right? Like I was teasing, but not. We don't start in September and go all the way through April. No school operates that way. There's all kinds of changes, right? So just getting our hands around what is the modal coaching experience and can we um, apply that um, predictably enough that we can measure it? That's a lot of what falls into this implementation study. We're also taking a continuous improvement lens. Um, so this, this has everything to do with that research practice partnership. We don't want to come in and say we're doing this coaching model no matter what. We want to be responsive to what we're hearing, iterate, make changes, because that's the only thing that makes this sustainable. 
We are still looking at, five, at year five as being an option for a, a high rigor RCT. We're, we're saying RCT-ish, we're figuring this out. Um, ultimately, we want an RCT. That is the gold standard for being able to talk about the effectiveness of any program. But one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up um, is to just really highlight what it takes to get to that level of rigor. You don't just step in to an RCT. You have to really build that over time. I think we had a huge exhale in the last couple of weeks or months when, when this, this uh, design change locked in. So we got away from all of our little private chats that's right the whole big group meeting that's and, right oh god what's that mean? yeah exactly we finally finally all came together and these and these national media i mean there's 25 30 people on zoom i mean it's it's a it's really a, a large wonderful group okay so let me talk you through this for a moment so in order to find out whether coaching is changing instructional practices and in order to find out whether instructional practices changing are uh, promoting deeper learning for students, we have a pretty broad measurement strategy. So I'll, I'll kind of take the, the uh, rows first. So one thing we want to measure is how APL coaching and training is being implemented. So under that kind of peach level uh, color bar, we are measuring how training and coaching is delivered what teachers think of training and coaching. We always say like satisfaction with training is necessary, but not sufficient. If people don't like it, like this totally aligns with the pillars, right? If it's not engaging, if it's not interactive, you're just not going to learn that much. It's not going to be that sticky. Um, we're interested in what principals think about APL. I'll talk some more about the, the campus level in a moment. In the gold bar, we also need to measure what changes as a result of participating in training and coaching. Those include teacher beliefs and attitudes and knowledge. That includes the six practices, which we've, we've talked about, and then it includes those student outcomes. The last part, the gray part, is understanding what moderates this relationship, right? So what are the conditions under which Training and coaching seems to change instructional practice. So I have a total catch all here, but like factors that help or hinder, right? And that could be anything from uh, tenure in the school, right? Have you been teaching for one year or 20? What's the campus climate? Like, is this, is this a campus that really promotes innovation or is this a campus that's like, no, no, get that worksheet done, right? Like check it, check it off the, off the list. And then y'all X marks the spot, right? So across the top are our measurement, our data sources. Um, so the first column is activity logs. Our coaches record so much information. Any of you all who are out there doing um, field-based research, you know those activity logs, keeping track of exactly what you did is a critical part of these kinds of applied research designs. We do uh, training surveys, we do administrator surveys and interviews. Um, these annual teacher surveys, teachers are reporting on themselves, right? Their own, especially the uh, beliefs, attitudes, and knowledge. That's how we're getting that information. We're also asking teachers to report on select students. So instead of reporting on every student in the room, we're doing a random sample so they can um, limit the amount of time they're filling out surveys for us. Oh, I wanna talk specifically about classroom observations and then the achievement data. So the practices and the pillars, like you can imagine if I'm the teacher doing that, um, that measurement lesson, and you're coming in to observe me, how do I know as an observer whether I'm looking at the target practices? Like, is this an APL classroom? Is this what we want? So doing direct observations of classroom instruction has been a really key component of the study, and we're still working on it, right? We've, we've landed on the cup top 
the classroom observation protocol and teacher observation protocol, which are highly reliable, like really excellent tools and difficult to collect. Like you have to have a real uh, uh, high caliber observer, like somebody very thoroughly trained, lots of careful reliability. Um, and so, so part of what we're figuring out is the feasibility of getting that level of observational data across the this many classrooms. Um, for uh, student outcomes, of course, we're getting lots of uh, achievement data. This is secondary data that comes from the school district, right? So um, NWEA map, star scores, these kinds of things, which tell us a lot and give us a lot of ability to compare APL students to other students, um, but also miss a lot, right? And, and don't really get kind of that richness about uh, certainly doesn't me measure collaboration, critical thinking, those kinds of things. Um, I don't know why I said additional measures being developed. That's prop. Oh, that's the six C's, right? We're still working on that. <laughs> but but uh, would love to hear y'all's y'all's thoughts on on moving in that direction as well. OK, I'm going to just briefly talk about a, a couple of other layers of the project. So while APL is primarily a coaching study, that means our primary intervention is with classroom teachers. We also um, expand that out to think about um, APL at the campus level. Um, so this means we're doing a lot of outreach with uh, principals to understand how this fits with what they're working on in their own schools. Um, it's it, there's there's a little bit of a um, either or here because you could imagine um, a principal really being a champion of an initiative like this and wanting to have a school that feels like this and a school that that operates around these value orientations. You could also imagine, and this happens for us pretty frequently, a principal who is so pulled in thousands of directions. I swear, being a principal is the hardest job hands down and so they say yeah smu sure come on yeah sure go go ahead go coach and we never see them again because they're doing 99 other things right i don't i don't mean that dismissively but we are also finding that sometimes just working with the teacher we're actually getting some traction right so it doesn't necessarily have to be this whole kind of school level uh, like a like a school reform intervention, a lot of things about the school and the operation of the school can remain intact and we can still get some of that change that we're looking for just within the classroom. Teachers have more autonomy in their classrooms than we sometimes give them credit for. The last piece is around parent, uh, sorry, around community engagement. So we're thinking a lot about uh, the role of parent engagement. Um, these math lessons, like the, the bean bag, we had our one of our um, coordinators come home from Chicago and play this game with her own children in the driveway, right? It's It really lends itself to transferability out of the classroom. So we're, we're thinking a lot about how to create more homeschool connections and parent engagement in this way. Tons more to say about that, but I'm gonna leave it there for now. Over the next four years, we are aiming to train and coach 250 teachers, K through four. Um, so we're working with um, Dallas ISD's early learning department to, to, to think with them about how that fits their needs, which schools would be the best to go to, this kind of thing. Um, and we may also be doing some more outreach to other uh, North Texas districts um, just to see if we can get get those numbers. The numbers are important for the study, right? So so the reach and the, the sample size is is really important for us to be able to make some um, higher evidence uh, claims about about the effectiveness of APL. And as we said, we're aiming to expand. We've now been in pre-K K1. 
we now need to add second, third, fourth. So there's a lot of resources that need to be developed around that. And we're starting to work, I say we, it's not me, it's the national team, <laughs> uh, developing web resources as well so that so that teachers can go and pull down resources and lesson plans and these kinds of things. OK, so I'm going to stop there. I think I'm about on time and we'll open up for some questions. I can see some folks on Zoom there too, or Teams, sorry. All right, you have some comments too? Well, I, yeah, well, please. I, I have a ton. I, I want to keep, I wanted to speak every time yeah. I said everything, but I, I just want to say thank you so much yeah. for um, joining our lecture series yeah. this spring. Yeah. Uh, it's an honor for us to have you and it has been an honor to collaborate with you in this okay. past year. Yeah. I can't believe it's only been one year. Yeah, I know. There's been a lot and there's a yeah. lot to come yeah. and it is a somewhat overwhelming <laughs> study. And every time you talk about everything we're doing here, yeah. multiply that by four. Right, right. Because there's four states and right. I mean right. it's it's really big. It's a big undertaking. And I look forward to us all getting together in person yeah. a few times that yeah. we have. Yeah. And we always yeah. look for more. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great, great, great. Yeah, got a question? Oh, good question. Yeah. So the question was around how other professionals in the schools um, participate in APL. So um, such a good question. So so you heard me talk about APL as it could be a classroom level intervention, right? You could have one teacher, maybe it's one teacher in one school who takes this on and implements it in that classroom. You could also imagine a campus that has more of an APL vibe to it, right? So where multiple teachers are, are working on the same ideas. Um, you could imagine uh, PLCs, professional learning communities, where, where teachers either within the same grade level or across grade levels are sharing ideas on this, swapping it out. Um, you could imagine instead of just being within a single classroom, if you've got kids lined up in the hallway doing the number line, mm -hmm. why not do that with other classrooms too, right? Or everybody go out on the field and you know incorporate the games together, these kinds of things. Um, we also think that there's a lot of connection to parent engagement and parent outreach. So um, uh, imagine if your PTA meeting or whatever, you know, PTO, whatever the, the uh, name is at each individual campus opened with a game. So we talked to, we talk about like, what if a campus adopted home play instead of home work? And that instead of taking that worksheet home or doing that Zoom lesson or whatever it is, that there's a real um, incorporation of, of this kind of back and forth across the boundary of the school and home environment. Um, those are some examples that, that come to mind. What do you think? Do you see some opportunities too? I feel like I'm just fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I don't know, I feel like maybe feel like there's like a push in type model or another intervention study. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We'll add that to the model. Um, I'll come right back to this side. Yeah, please. Thank you for that. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. I have lots of questions, but also but you mentioned measuring the state school. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, one of the things you mentioned is it's interesting to get a lot of red flags on the map for the kindergarten. Indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah. But then um, a big question to me is measuring positive approaches to learning or something about their attitude towards school. And I'll get back to my kindergarten trying to do virtual school. Yeah. He loved virtual school because I was there. Yeah. And I could play with him after right. those students. Right. And so right. he likes classes where there's this kind of stuff happening. He's very verbal about it and articulate on this stuff, but like if he has any thoughts, he will like the class and like learning. And so it's like speed things don't get the positive feels mm -hmm. about school. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that seems like that would be mm -hmm. easy to measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, is it yeah, well said. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think this um, kind of overarching idea of playful, joyful classrooms gets at that, right? It's not it's not necessarily like in that measurement model, though maybe it should be. But but the the joyful classroom means 
not just the teacher, right? That 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 positive affect kind of it it builds on each other, right? Oh, and we are talking about very global atmospheric like observation measures. The whole cop top uh, yeah. protocol. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say we're struggling with. We're we're actually very interested in the data that exists on classrooms to see the extent to which these kinds of practices are not happening and we've got lots of room to make change. You don't know, you talk to teachers in these workshops and you know they got the right principles, they've got the right design, I don't want to say right. They've got the desires that are very consistent with what we're talking about. Um, I hope we can help them find ways to actually implement what we know works better and bring more joy to the classroom. Uh, you can observe the atmosphere of the classroom. Mm -hmm. They've done it for years. Mm -hmm. I hope we are. <laughs> for those of you on, online, I'll just recap that in case you didn't hear it, but but Margaret is talking about this um, really sincere push to kind of capture what joyful feels like and, and pulling in some atmospheric um, observations that we, we have precedence for, right? That we, we could start pulling in, in addition to that really rigorous observation of the practices, right? That's part of it. We want that. And we want like, what does it feel like in here for, for the whole room and for the adults and the children in the room? Uh, let me go here. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. Yeah, let me try to take those one at a time. So remember that little grid, right? Where so like we said, like we're not trying to do away with direct instruction. There is some important learning that takes place in that modality. We are trying to see more frequent moments of this active engaged learning. Um, we think that those two types of learning can can supplement each other. So if a child is uh, has that active, playful learning experience, they're engaged, they did the thing. Now maybe they can sit down, be attentive, right? Because they've got some investment in it. They had that fun morning learning experience. Like maybe now they're primed to do a little bit of that direct. Um, we are very sensitive to the tension between um, like standardized testing, but like the primacy of, of that in classrooms and what we are pitching. And so we're really we're working on our languaging around this. Like we've gotten feedback. Please don't call it playful. Please don't call it playful. I can't get this approved if the word playful is in it. Right. Um, so we go, OK, OK. Can we call it active learning? Yeah, that works, right? Um, so um, what we're really trying to make the case and and we're trying to study this along the way of how those two can can coexist and support each other. Um, we think that um, if and when teachers adopt some of these strategies, not all day long. We are not asking for a total transformation over like we do not expect this kind of instruction to happen all day every day. We do think that if teachers do more of this, they're going to see positive results on those standardized tests that everybody cares about um, because the deeper learning is taking place. We have also worked because Dallas ISD, you all may know, has the uh, Teacher Excellence Initiative, TEI. We've worked really hard to, to show teachers and principals how APL and TEI support one another, right? So we're not putting these things at odds with each other. They really, they really work together. Um, I can't remember your second question. Oh, I didn't, I didn't ask. It was just one more question. Oh, my second one was more fun. I know you mentioned that you were. Uh -huh. Yeah. I just kind of want to know your journey. Of oh, like, fun. And also, like, how you kind of got into working with like this. Yeah, yeah, great question. Oh, repeat it. Thank you, Rachel, for reminding me. Um, okay, great. So, 
uh, folks online. I hope you heard the first question, which is around kind of how we're dealing with that tension between um, the, the standardized testing way of teaching and, and active playful learning. And the second question was like, I mean, I'm teasing you, but like, what is community psychology? <laughs> how did you end up there? I think uh, I think my 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 parents, my parents are here today. Yeah, I guess um, I, you know, nobody really knows what community psychology is. I'm just kidding. Uh, clinical community psychology. Um, this is division 27 of the APA, if anyone is interested. Um, of course, clinical psychology. Here, here's here's my elevator elevator speech. Clinical psychology puts individuals and families on the couch and tries to understand the, the nature of problems and solutions within individuals and within small units. Community psychology puts communities on the couch and clinical community puts those things together so that we really are trying to understand both problems and solutions at the individual and the more like socio-cultural um, uh, level. And um, I identify more with community psychology, which puts solutions at the community level, right? So if we can start to pull some of these levers for social change, we start to see more well-being in individuals as well. I landed in educational program evaluation. Um, through um, working on a number of projects in grad school, right? You guys are all in this right now. One of my professors had a had a grant uh, working with um, Safe Schools Healthy Students grants. Does anybody remember those? Um, those were initiatives that put together school districts, sheriff's offices, juvenile justice, mental health and substance abuse prevention centers in communities, trying to pull all the levers at once. And one of the outcomes was looking at um, educational outcomes for students. And so I was assigned to like that part of the evaluation. Um, I did think though, originally, I thought I was gonna go to law school and work on like educational civil rights. So like maybe there's a through line through some of that as well. Mandy, oh, you yeah, 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 please we come. Yeah, wrap up. yeah, please. So I'm gonna ask another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, this touched on a little bit. I'm a little curious. I mean, getting to work with such a big school district, yeah. with so many things. Just what were maybe one or two of DISD's biggest concerns, and mm -hmm. how did you address them? It was that question. It was. It's this question around. Um, I I think being able to say this type of coaching will help you implement Eureka math was a real was a real opportunity for us. There's there's a lot there are so many um, really excellent leaders within this district who want APL classrooms, right? They want that. That is why they do their job too. And they have to balance that out with all of the, the criteria and compliance that they're required to do. So for us to be able to say, here's this really wonderful offering, and it's going to help you check a box on this major initiative that you're responsible for this year. That was kind of a stroke of luck, Mandy. Like that was just sometimes the timing works out on these things. Um, the, the focus on early childhood, right? The early years has, was also kind of a nice little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they do have that big. Well, in Eureka, my understanding, it's a, I mean, just having watched it, I have kids who yeah, 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 just yeah. heard Eureka. And it is a big shift yes. in the way they're teaching math. And I think yeah. it is throwing off some of the teachers. It's totally. really good, mm -hmm. but it does see, so I can see yeah. how that really, yeah. well, that timing makes a lot of sense. One of the things we heard about Eureka was that it was very scripted. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is both an opportunity and a challenge, right? Is how to, how to show teachers that they can stick with the script and have fun with it. Yeah. Right. There's nowhere in the script that says you can't have the kids in small groups. There's nowhere in the script that says you don't connect it to their own home environment or something. Right. So I think there's I think that kind of weaving together this tale of how how these things are compatible with one another. Look, you just you just helped me like tie this up. That's the research practice. Yeah. Right. Like that's exactly what we have to we have to find that connection between.
Well, thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Bye. Online folks, 